साएं इतना दीजिए सामे कुटुम समाए मैं भी भूखा ना रहूं साधु ना भूखा जाए Good morning, lovely to see you all in person on our second day of the ninth edition of the JLF at London at the British Library. Thank you for being here. This is a much awaited session. So before we start, delighted to present Rebels Against the Raj, Ramchandra Guha in conversation with William Dalrymple. In Rebels Against the Raj, Western Fighters for India's Freedom, historian and writer Ramchandra Guha chronicles the unexplored narratives of seven people who fought for the end of imperial rule between the late 19th and early 20th century. Motivated by idealism and genuine sacrifice, each connected to Gandhi and representing diverse schools of thought, they risked fatal punishment for their activism, even as they made invaluable contributions to India's independence struggle. Ram Guha, a historian and biographer based in Bengaluru, has taught at the universities of Yale and Stanford, held the Arne Nas chair at the University of Oslo, and served at the Philippe Roman Professor of History and International Affairs at the London School of Economics. Guha's books on award-winning social history of cricket, a corner of a foreign field, which was chosen by The Guardian as one of the 10 best books on cricket ever written. Guha has also published a much acclaimed two volume biography of Mahatma Gandhi, both of which were chosen as notable books of, of the year by the New York Times. Guha's most recent book is Rebels Against the Raj, Western Fighters for India's Freedom. Published in January 2022, Guha's many awards include the Leopold Hidi Prize of the American Society of Environmental History, the Daily Telegraph Cricket Society Prize, the Ramnath Goenka Prize for Excellence in Journalism, the Sahitya Academy Award, and the R.K. Narayan Prize in 2009, the Padma Bhushan, India's third largest civilian honor. William Dalrymple is the best-selling author of the Wilson Prize-winning White Mughals, The Last Mughal, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, and the Hemingway and Kapunchki Prize winning a Return of a King, a King, his most recent book, The Anarchy, was shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington Medal, the Tata Book of the Year, and Historical Writers Association Award, was a finalist for the Kandil Prize for History and won the 2020 Arthur Ross Medal from the U.S. Council of Foreign Relations. Dalrymple has been awarded five honorary doctorates in a fellow to the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. 
and has held visiting lectureships at Princeton, Brown, and Oxford, where he is currently an honorary uh, Bodleian Fellow. In 2019, he was presented with the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy and was named one of the world's top 50 thinkers for 2020 by Prospect. He is a founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival. We would like you to please follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet and tag using hashtag uh, JLF London at British Library, hashtag JLF London 2022, and tag using at JLF Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebels Against the Raj, Ramchandra Guha in conversation with William Dunford. You guys have to give awards, man. I haven't been on stage with Ram since about 20 years ago in Sydney <laughs> when we were in the Sydney Writers' Festival together. So this is a long due catch-up. Ram, we had all his, his awards and, and all his honours, but he is, quite simply, what he wouldn't write on his own biography, the most distinguished historian of modern India uh, and unquestionably uh, the most sought-after commentator on contemporary India. Uh, his works have cut uh, a, a complete swathe through the historiography of post-independence India, but more recently he's also become an incredibly distinguished biographer uh, with his two monumental volumes uh, on Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, it's an unparalleled body of work, but interspersed with all sorts of strange surprises, of, uh, uh, including where he started off uh, as an environmental historian, the subject of his PhD in Calcutta, <coughs> Uh, and uh, since then, also won awards for sports writing, which is not something that normally goes either with monumental biography or with uh, uh, political commentating, or least of all with environmentalism. So he is uh, an odd fish, but an extremely distinguished and remarkable one. Uh, and a very, very important voice today uh, in modern India. Um, and uh, his, his, his stands on various issues, uh, his newspaper columns uh, have led to him not only uh, being recognized in the world of academia, where he's only one of uh, three uh, historians, uh, along with uh, Jagannath Saka uh, and uh, Romna Thapa, to be made an honorary foreign member of the American Historical Society, which is an incredible, um, sorry, uh, the American Historical Association, which is uh, a, a very, very grand honor. Uh, but also, at a popular level, he has 2.2 million Twitter followers, as I just checked uh, this morning. <laughs> which sort of puts him on a, on a par with sort of Shah Rukh Khan and, uh, <laughs> and beautiful actresses in Bollywood. Uh, so he, he wears uh, a variety of hats, uh, none of which would necessarily be thought of sitting on the same hat stand, uh, but, they, uh, but they make for uh, a unique uh, and highly distinguished figure. His new book um, is a slight departure in some ways from the, the three monumental tomes which have preceded it, but in other ways, in a sense, carry on uh, very clearly from the trajectory uh, of his uh, wonderful early biography of Veria Elwin, uh, a, a Brit uh, who um, was closely associated with Gandhi, but was also uh, a, a very uh, important figure of recognizing the distinct culture uh, of the tribals, which made him fit easily into neither camps. And, Ram, in a sense, I think has, has a, a, a natural sympathy with people that don't naturally fit into easy boxes. And um, he has, um, in this book, collected seven figures who I think are a huge surprise to anyone that reads it, whatever direction they're coming from. I think Indians would be very surprised today, uh, particularly, in a sense, as the memories of first-hand encounters with the Raj disappear into history that many Brits did fight on the side of Indian freedom. Equally, I think many Brits will be surprised that there was uh, a tradition of dissent against the empire, uh, which is not a sort of modern Guardian reading liberal thing as portrayed in the culture wars by uh, people like Oliver Dowden in his polemics in The Telegraph, 
who represents uh, 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 opposition to empire as being somehow uh, what in India would be called anti-national, but anti-patriotic and un-British. Uh, and we've had many distinguished historians of empire this side of the pond uh, who have recently been under attack. I was yesterday on stage with David Olusaga, um, who uh, an amazing historian of slavery and, and the uh, greatest historian of, of the black British. And he, I didn't, he, he was too modest to, or, 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 or didn't mention it, but I kept noticing this sort of uh, large uh, bearded character standing beside him who I thought was some quiet fan. Of course, it was a bodyguard. Uh, and he's literally walking around in a literary festival yesterday uh, with, uh, with bodyguards because of the th uh, threats he's had from people who think that to attack the British Empire is to attack modern Britain and to attack our legacy. And one of the things I hope that this session will do is, is to show that there are long routes to dissent against empire, that it's not a modern thing, it's not a knee-jerk, it's not something woke that was invented two years ago, it's not something that liberal, liberal Guardian reading Hampstead intellectuals dreamt up in 1970. Uh, it's something that goes back right to the roots of imperialism. And that many people in this country and, uh, and, and in the non-Indian world have dedicated their lives um, wholeheartedly to opposing imperialism, to opposing, uh, to opposing slavery, uh, and that dissent uh, is one of the, uh, to empire is as important a part of the history of empire as empire itself. So, Ram, first question, should we be surprised by these people? Yeah, so uh, before I answer that question, thank you all for coming here. It's a particular pleasure to be at the British Library, which is, uh, in the spirit of what Willie just said, my second favorite archive in the world. <laughs> the favorite archive being the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi. Nicer garden, it has to be said. <laughs> <laughs> and more materials related to my work, too. That's so. And peacocks and so on. So, it's really, but many of my books have been we need based more in part on. Finish library next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, many of my books have been based in part on research in the British Library. So, it's really nice to be here. So, uh, should we be surprised? I think Indians are also surprised, as you said. Obviously, the British. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, maybe more so, but the Indians are also surprised because what the one character in this book who is reasonably well known out of the seven I've talked about is Madeleine Slate, the British Admiral's daughter who was a failed concert pianist and then found Gandhi and then became a disciple of Gandhi. But there are aspects to her life which I talk about uh, which were not known in the kind of nationalist hagiography. Ha and she was represented as a kind of um, Devoted daughter of Gandhi who obediently followed him and took his cause across the world. Whereas uh, some, of, some of the other rebels are rebels, were rebels against the Raj, but they were also rebels against obnoxious aspects of Indian society. They were fighting for gender equality, for the freedom of the press, uh, for um, against rapacious industrial forces that were destroying the countryside. There's some pioneering environmentalists in this list. Uh, for women's education, you know. Uh, one of the, the last character with whom I end was a Londoner uh, called Catherine Mary Heilman, who took the Indian name Sarala Devi and started the first girls' school uh, in Uttarakhand, well beyond Nanital, in the most backward and patriarchal part of North India. That's saying something, you know. The, and uh, many of her wards went on to become leading activists in the Chipko environmental movement and so on. So these were rebels also against. Um, Hindu Raj, male Raj, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's what made them, makes them distinctive. And I completely agree with you that there is a long tradition of British descent. The first footnote to my book is to a forgotten book by A.J.P. Taylor called The Troublemakers, uh, which is, we actually, he actually considered it his best book. It's about 19th century British radicals who opposed imperialism, like John Bright and, Will, and Charles Bradlaugh and so on. Uh, the difference between those people and um, these seven is that they actually came to India, became Indians, sometimes married Indians, and above all, identified to the extent of being arrested or deported. I'll just say one last thing. This book, uh, <coughs> really, is a long-delayed sequel to my Elwin biography because Elwin bitterly regretted not being arrested. He felt he hadn't gone far enough. He signed a... Yes. Uh, he signed a taking. He had come here to see his ailing mother. 
And the British said, we won't let you get back, go back unless you sign this undertaking. So he always felt... Not to be involved in politics. Not to something. be involved in politics. Yeah. So he felt regretful. He also felt slightly envious of some of the others in this book whom we knew who had actually gone to, gone to jail. So this is a book that's been in my mind for a very long time while working on my Gandhi biographies and so on, uh, while working on India after Gandhi, which was commissioned by my friend Peter Strauss, still yeah. sitting right here. So I'm thank, great, grateful to, to him for coming here because he, in a sense, changed my life by commissioning India after Gandhi. Uh, while doing these other books, I was kind of in the archives. As you know, you go to the archives and you're working on one project, there's, there's another project and you just file it away somewhere. And I had always had I, a file in my notebook. Exactly the same way I was yeah. doing um, Last Mogul and yeah. was waiting for papers in the National Archives and was browsing in the catalogue and there was this, this, sorry, this thing, White Moguls, and there was this thing called the Mutiny Papers. Among yeah. the, yeah. But for sitting, but for the no, not having had the papers when they arrived, that would never have happened. These yeah, exactly. accidental... In, exactly. in, yeah. So I ha always had a file, uh, in, first in my handwritten notebooks and then in my laptop, called The Other Side of the Raj, where I filed away clippings. Lovely. And, uh, uh, you know, then when the pandemic hit and I couldn't travel... I looked at all that I had, and I felt there was a book in it. So this was, it's very interesting, this, I mean, it'd be interesting to do a survey, because whenever I've been to literary festivals lately, all the books, obviously, that are being talked about are stories that writers had to write in pandemics, when often libraries were closed, or there was only a few online resources to, to go for. So there's a, a completely different sort of wave of literature coming at the moment as a result of the pandemic, and awful. Also, just a sheer volume of it, because... Um, writers manage to distract themselves very nicely with things like the Jaipur Literature Festival, which takes them out of their study, gets them to meet their, their, their readers, and it's thoroughly enjoyable, but it means you're not writing, you're sitting on a stage. Uh, and suddenly we've had a whole two-year period when writers have not been able to get to festivals. Uh, they've had to sit in their studies, and they've had to write. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a great outpouring of literature. There should be a, a book on, on pandemic histories and the pandemic writing. Um, well, you also mentioned in your footnotes a book you came across, a very nice little anecdote about in a second-hand bookstore in Bangalore. It sounds very similar, in a sense, from the other side to the AG, a mirror to the A.G.P. Yeah, Taylor yeah. book. So it was called Foreign Friends of India's Freedom. And it was a series of uh, talks given by a now-forgotten British liberal called P. Koranda Rao, Indian, I beg pardon, Indian liberal called P. Koranda Rao. And the Indian liberals were kind of um, sidelined by Gandhi because they believed in petitions, not in satyagraha. I mean, they wanted slow, incremental change. Uh, and uh, this man, uh, who was a follower of uh, V.S. Srinivasa Sastri, another great liberal of those days, wrote, gave a series of uh, broadcasts on All India Radio on the 25th anniversary of Indian independence called Foreign Friends of India's Freedom. Now, it's interesting that 25 years after independence, you could pay homage to these people. All India Radio is not going to commission a series of broadcasts based on my book today. Because everything foreign and white is bad in India today. Right. But where, where's Shashi sitting? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll have a word with you later, Shashi. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, so I found this book, and it was just kind of chatty stories about some of these people. And it also inspired me, of course, I hopefully dug much deeper than my uh, uh, fellow townsmen in Bangalore. But I make a distinction in this book between bridge builders and rebels. That, that book was I'm mostly about bridge builders. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. And, and you see them as two different... Yeah, absolutely. Some went to jail and some didn't. Uh, That's yeah. right. So some were friends of India, like C.F. Andrews, who was a great friend of Gandhi and Tagore, but maintained very civil terms with archbishops and viceroys at the same time. Our remarkable man did great work in ending indentured labor in Fiji and the Caribbean. Sister Devedita, who was a spiritual leader in Bengal. Laurie Baker, the architect. Many public school masters who nurtured uh, lots of bright Indians, including Vikram Seth, uh, for example, uh, later on. But they were really bridge builders. And I, let me tell a story about the title of this yeah. book. Really. This is called Rebels Against the Raj, which is a serviceable, adequate title, describes the contents of the book but not, is not the original title. The original title was Renegades. Renegades, Western Fighters for India's Freedom. And uh, the subtitle remains the same. And Renegades actually describes these people much better. Now, it so happened that uh, three months before my book was going to press, two American gentlemen published a book called Renegades. Well, okay, and the names of those gentlemen were Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but publisher said you're not going to compete with them. That also said Renegades was won early title of White Boogles. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, I'm sorry about that. The book is dedicated to Jean Dres, who's India's most distinguished economist, Belgian born. So, it's dedicated to him, and I had to change the dedication because the dedication was to Jean Dres, a renegade of our time. Now, it's just flat boring for Jean Dres. So, you know. <laughs> Maybe if you had called white Mughals renegades, uh, Barack Obama would have sued you for, <laughs> for what he was going to do later. But again, so the distinction on one hand to the bridge builders who, who, who stayed within the establishment uh, and who didn't make the leap uh, into actual protest, arrest, and prison. Uh, but you also, in, in introduction, do contrast it with white Mughals. Um, uh, just say why, not, and then maybe I can so, answer uh, that. Yeah. Well, I think there are two reasons. Uh, yeah. William Dalrymple's book, White Mughals, which is, uh, was set in the 18th century. And I argue, that this may be contested, that in the 18th century, but it was easier to cross boundaries across racial barriers. That's true. Uh, and in the early 20th century, where imperialism and nationalism had solidified, it's more, it was more difficult. So I, that's one reason. And the other reason, I think, is none of these characters were Mughals. You know, white or otherwise, they were traveling in third class compartments, they were often pawning their wives' jewelry. You know, they were really, really difficult lives, you yeah. know. So in that sense, so in that sense, I felt that the 20th century was to come, actually come to India. And uh, I also make a comparison. In the epilogue of the book, I say these people, the, the white renegades of my book, uh, who operated in the early 20th century onwards, work in, in British India and took the side of the Indian freedom movement, were comparable to the white radicals who joined the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, who were traitors to their race and their religion. And it took incredible bravery for people like Albie Sachs, Bram Fisher, yeah. Ruth First, Joe Slover, you know, and the kind of torture yeah. and suffering uh, they uh, underwent in the cause of the cause of the blacks and the browns. So that, I think, is how I would look and, at it. And a closer parallel, in the sense, to the Spanish Civil War, where you have the yes. international case, where they were fighting for an admired cause, but not fighting their own culture. Not, and, not, yeah. and they were travelers. They went in the Spanish Civil and War. They come back. They went, they went for a few months and came back. Yeah. So I think the white communists in South Africa, often, often they were often communist and often Jewish, as it turned out. Many of them Jewish, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think these people are sort of uh, analogous to them. The, I, mean, I was interested in... in I, Read, I was very flattered that, that you made the comparison with white modals. And in some ways, you're quite right, because many of my characters in that book are residents at courts, living in, in large houses, and so on. Um, but what is true is that they often shared with your characters, of course, the conflict of being between two, 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 uh, two worlds. And so, for example, James Kirkpatrick, the main character of the book, is in continual conflict with Lord Wellesley, the Governor General. And the more that Lord Wellesley um, uh, does what Boris Johnson's currently doing with the Brexit Treaty in, in Northern Ireland uh, and altering the, uh, the, the wordings to suit himself against what's actually been signed, um, Kirkpatrick puts up some very, very strong opposition and is on the verge of being sacked. And only when he pulls off this incredible deal, which pr effectively preserves Hyderabad State right up until 1948, till Operation yeah. Pueblo. Um, and and you know, it, it preserves Hyderabad State as the largest princely state is this enormous, rich state for all its problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right up until uh, long after um, yeah. independence, not long after, but a, a year yeah. after. Um, and so the, I think it, it is interesting, and what I think is the parallel is that your characters and my characters both very strongly have to leave one culture to a yeah. certain extent yeah. in order to be accepted by another, yeah. and yet never quite can be accepted by either. And James Skinner, who's, who's slightly different again because he's an Anglo-Indian, he's not, he's not someone who is, who, is, who is a white guy who, is, who has entered the world, but he says how his, how his position between India and, and, and the coming uh, East India uh, Company uh, made, was, was like a sword that cut both ways against me. Yeah. And, and that's true, I think, of many of our characters, that, yeah, they, that, yeah. they, that, they, that they, while embracing one world, they're not always accepted Correct. by Correct. the other world. I'd say of uh, uh, the seven characters in, in my book, the last, uh, uh, the educationist, Catherine Mary Heilman, who adopted the name Sarla Ben, uh, was adopted most fully in the Himalaya, partly because she became absolutely fluent in Hindi and Kumauni, and, uh, wrote, <laughs> and, and wrote her books in that, lang in that language. 
And there's a lovely story of her, you know, trekking in the Himalaya. Those of you who know, you know, it's a very arduous terrain. And there's a, there was a colleague of hers with her, an Indian colleague, and remembers she tripped. And she said, Baap re Baap. <laughs> Not, oh my God, Baap re Baap, you know. So <laughs> her chappals fell down in the river. She walked bare feet to the next village where she found a cobbler to give her chappals. But she said, Baap re Baap. So you know, she had completely indigenous. The others were always, you know, wondering, often they also had, and this is, you know, uh, they often had anxious mothers in England or America trying to bring them back. So one of them, Stokes, for example, you know, his mother really doesn't want him to go native, you know, and is very worried about it and so on. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's certainly true. It's, that a, it's a very interesting thing, because I'm thinking again now of my characters. Um, there were some, like David Dr. Lonely, for example, who had lost his world. He, was, yeah. he had been born in Boston yeah. and fought on the wrong side of the American Revolution and had nowhere to go back to. He couldn't return home. Although, though he had Scots relations, he'd never been to Scotland, hardly knew Scotland. So he totally committed to, right. to, to, to India and, and, and married in, yeah. and in the end fell out with the East India Company in exactly the same way uh, as, as so many of these did, and, and died away from his house in, in, in disgrace in Meerut, while, uh, fleeing yeah. Delhi. And there, and there are many other characters. Todd um, was, was, was deemed yeah. too Rajput to deal with the Rajputs. Yeah. Uh, so again, this, you fall into this sort of indeterminate category in the middle. But what I am fascinated by is, is, is how much support these characters often get here. Yeah. And again, we, I had assumed before writing my books that, that there was an overwhelming support for the empire, that the empire was something which obviously brought prosperity to this country at the cost of India, which, uh, which it, uh, rose, brought Britain from the middle rank of Europe, well behind uh, Portugal and Spain in, in terms of riches, and certainly behind Italy and France. Uh, but in the course of, uh, of the 18th century, transfer of, of huge sums of money from Bengal to England, Britain, and well, first England, then Britain, rises up uh, to the primary economy of Europe. And I always assume that people here would therefore have seen it as, as, as an important thing of their economy and something they supported. But if, there's a huge hatred of the East India Company in the 18th century, and, and of no one was more unpopular than Clive. And uh, there, was a, there was a whole play in the play market uh, where he was called Lord Vulture. Uh, he was uh, twice brought before Parliament. And when Parliament acquitted him, he began to be booed and, uh, and cissed in the streets of London. So eventually, he cut his own wrist. Uh, and when you read Horace Walpole and, 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 uh, or Bolts or any of these people, and, 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 and in the 20th century, Prim Vada Gopal has written about these other dissenters, there is this very, very strong tradition here of, of opposing imperial excesses. And, uh, and, and your characters, I think, are much less exceptional. I mean, no, no, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't way, want to get to you know, much, yeah. debates about your book versus my book. I mean, that's not why we're here. No, 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 That's not why we're here. You know, this is no, let me say this. Not, this is a book. This is a book about a new thing. This is a book about seven distinctive characters, and let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Before we get before we go through individually, first of all, methodologically, your your approach. You have always been someone very intrigued by biography. Uh, and that is slightly unusual in yeah, Indian yeah. historiography. And I think you've re recently given a lecture yeah. um, uh, on um, history and biography. Yeah. Uh, and, and talk about that a little. Because again, so, it's something yeah, Sunil Kilnani. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, absolutely. So, biography doesn't come easily to Indians. Indian historians did not come. I'll come about the exception now. Yeah did not come uh, for multiple reasons. I argue partly because of Hinduism, because if a person is dead, he's already been reborn in something else. There's no such thing as a distinctive finite life. We don't even have hagiographies of saints like in Islamic and Christian culture. Partly because of the overwhelming dominance of Marxism uh, in the Indian Academy, because Marxists disparage the influence of individuals. So Hinduism and Marxism has gone together to consolidate yeah. an opposition to biography, partly because Indians don't keep records, partly because Indians take offense at everything. <laughs> right. Uh, so, but I think that's changing. And I think- They still uh, take offense at everything. <laughs> they, they still take offense at everything. So uh, it, that, that's now changing, really, fortunately. I mean, some of the younger writers, for yeah. example- Manupalai. Huh? Manupalai. Salman yeah. Subramanian, if yeah. I talk of modern historians, Salman Subramanian's book on Haldane, uh, uh, you know, uh, Akshay Mukul, who's now writing a wonderful biography of the Hindi writer Agair, 
Uh, Sinath Raghavan, brilliant young historian, is writing on the uh, scientist Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. Dinyar Patel's magnificent book on uh, uh, Dada by Nauruji, which is a contribution to British and Indian history. So fortunately, that is changing. Uh, but there's still some people you can't write honestly about. You can't write honestly about Savarkar, Bose, possibly Ambedkar, possibly Shivaji. Nehru, Shivaji. You can write honestly about Gandhi because no one claims Gandhi. So, but I think some of these minor figures, uh, you know, like I think uh, uh, the Naroji book, I, I would recommend it to all of you. This Dinyar Patel is a brilliant young Indian American historian who, Naroji, we are not far from Finsbury, North Finsbury, where Naroji won an election in 1893. He was the first colored MP in England. He was also a major player in the Indian National Dice, Congress. Dice Somba was elected and then he had yeah, his Yeah, but he was cancelled. kind of half. He was kind of half, <laughs> half, 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 half. And Nauruji inspired Gandhi, Jinnah, and Gokhale. And he had the trade theory, you know, which you know about because yeah. of your recent work, you know, on the exploitation of India by the East India Company. He's the first person to talk about it. And this, this young man, I'll say a little bit about the kind of scholarship that is now coming out. Dinyar Patel found 50,000 pages of Nauruji's papers in a dump in the National Archives. He restored them. He learned Gujarati to read them. And now he's written this magnificent book. So I think the great thing is, when I started out 25 years ago, you know, there were some great British historians, for example, uh, biographers. For example, someone who inspired me greatly was a mutual friend of yours and mine, David Gilmore. You know, his works were Lampedusa and Kipling. Cousin. So when I was learning, learning the art of biography, it was people like Richard Holmes, uh, David Holroyd. Gilmore, huh? Michael Holroyd, Michael Holroyd yeah. you know, uh, Francis Spal uh, 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 Spalding and so on. But now Indians have taken to it because essentially, and I, I am not a jingoist, as all of you know, but I want to make one jingoist re remark or claim. <laughs> modern India has, and probably even ancient India, modern India has produced more interesting characters than any other country in the world. <laughs> and we read biographies of all of them, from the scoundrels and the rogues to the saints and the scholars. And I think now those will come. Do you find that there is a pushback from Indian academia when you give this biographical approach in your history writing? Do you, are you regarded yeah. as somehow unserious? Yeah. I was, I was. Yeah. And also from my American academia. I think the British, uh, you know, again, you know, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, it may be unfashionable, but there's a lot of nice things about the British, which I... <laughs> and not just the game of cricket. Not just, just the game of cricket. Not, not just the game of cricket. Uh, for example, biography is an art form that has really been perfected here. You know, I think, uh, uh, and, you know, the kind of... Americans also, it's only... America, the American biographical tradition is all about the greatness of the founders. That's it. You know, it's Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think... Uh, and the endless multi-volume biographies that come out yeah. every year. So I think, you know, this is, and you know, here you write about little unknown people, you know, the, the quest for Corvo, you know. Yeah. The fabulous kind of book. Only a British journalist could have written the quest for Corvo. So I think, in that sense, they was pushed, because I know the American Academy much better than I know the Britain, because I've taught in America and so on. And there often they will tell me, why have you abandoned your environmental research? It's so important. You know, why are you writing about one person, you know? write about structures, processes, grand scale. So I'd say uh, now I think things are changing. But essentially, it's nuance and subtlety that we want. We don't want worshipful hagiographies uh, that allied over complexity, that are written to please uh, people in power. One of the most abhorrent tendencies. And they say glorifying always. Yeah, and glorifying. one of the most abhorrent tendencies in Indian literary and uh, creative life today is authors and filmmakers wanting photographs with the prime minister. <laughs> you know, it, for, for the, for, it also shows you don't have confidence in your own work if you want to be photographed with the prime minister while publicizing your book or your film. So I think it's a subtlety. One, is not, one does not have to be adversarial to any government. You know, this could have happened to Indira Gandhi too. It's not just it's happening today. So I think that's what we need. We need independence and subtlety. And the young writers like whom you mentioned and I mentioned, I think are showing this. Also, you've, you're unusual in that while you've held many distinguished uh, visiting lectureships and, and, and have, have, have worked very closely with academia, you've remained independent. Yeah. You've stepped outside, you've had the time to write, you've had the time to do 
the kind of research which people couldn't do if they were marking exam papers or supervising PhDs yeah, yeah. in the same way. What made you make that decision? So it was made by accident, but it's been made possible. The sustained career has only been made possible by my wife, Sujata Keshavan, who's uh, a, a successful designer. And did the, uh, logo, among, did the Airtel logo, among other things? I did the Airtel yeah. logo and uh, the Delhi Airport and the Infosys logo, logo and Kotak Bank and many things. And it also consistently supported me, you know, in that she's never said, don't write on this, you know, be careful, you know, publish your book quickly because there's an anniversary. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, Peter Strauss commissioned <laughs> India after Gandhi in 1998. It took me 12 years to write it, right? So I think that, and I, not just my wife, being in Bangalore, which gives you certain distance. Yes, you would be suspicious of Delhi. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, so, you so, you so, so I think being the far away from Bangalore, uh, from Delhi, gives you a certain distance. Uh, also, it's great climate. You know, you can write the whole year. If you're in Delhi, when I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, you have to run, run, run away <laughs> in the dust storms. So I think all of this. So, and also, I started, I must say also, I started writing for the press to make a living. And again, in, when I'm in the business of thanking people, who have really nurtured and enabled all that I've done. Abhik Sarkar, editor of The Telegraph, who is the most, in, former editor, who's the most independent-minded newspaper proprietor in India. A renegade and, newspaper proprietor. A renegade <laughs> newspaper proprietor, and the only newspaper proprietor who has never wanted a Rajya Sabha seat. <laughs> so, and has allowed me to write what I want. So, I think these are the kinds of things that uh, allow it. So, on to your characters. Who, who should we, I mean, I, I, Madeleine Slade has to be the first, surely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, so Madeleine Slade, as, as, as I said, is reasonably well known because... But probably not here, except oh. from the film. Except from the film, yeah. So, in, so she was a British admiral's daughter, uh, a failed concert pianist, obsessed with Beethoven. And partly she failed because in the 1920s, Beethoven was unpopular because of Germany after the war. And she reads the French writer Romain Rolla's biography of uh, Beethoven, goes to meet him, and he tells her, my next book is about Gandhi, and she says, Gandhi who? And then she reads this book, flips, comes and joins Gandhi, uh, becomes his devoted assistant, uh, then undertakes propaganda tours for him in this country where she meets Churchill, who's hostile, and then goes to America and meets Eleanor Roosevelt in the White House, who is sympathetic, then becomes, after Gandhi dies, a pioneering environmentalist in the Himalaya, and does amazing work, particularly on the question of deforestation, and chemical agriculture, the dangers of chemical agriculture. And in 1959, she's in a remote ashram in Keri Garwal, in the watershed of the Ganga, when Beethoven comes back to her in her mind. Yeah. And she returns to Austria at the age of 65, after 30 years outside, uh, outside Does India. Does she have a piano in, in Keri Garwal? Huh? Does she have a piano in Keri Garwal? No, she didn't. She had not played it. She not, she not played it. And she comes back, and she lives in the Vienna woods, and tries to write a book on Beethoven, gets a forward by Yehudi Menuhin, but the book is totally unpublishable. <coughs> is rejected by many publishers, and is finally, after her death, published by a Sarvadaya Khadi firm in Madurai as a homage to all that she's done for Gandhi. <laughs> now, but one thing she does do, lovely it's a lovely story, but one thing she does do, really, is that while she's in Austria, Attenborough comes to meet her. And at that stage, the late 70s, she is the she's, still only, alive. she's the only close associate of Gandhi who's alive. You know, Nehru is dead, yeah. Patel is dead, Kripladi is dead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he does these long interviews with her, and he thanks her in his book, In Search of Gandhi. And it's also dedicated to her, the film. Uh, though she she saw the early rushes and she complained that the actress who played her was I think Gwendolyn Jackson or someone, so it's far more glamorous than I ever was. <laughs> All right, which had to which <laughs> tells about Hollywood. But so she's one, uh, certainly one of the characters. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous story. And I'm better known here, Annie Besant, but still worth telling a, a, a quick canter through her life. Yeah, so Annie Besant was, a, was a, born in the 1840s, Irish. Uh, Again, flipped many times, you know, and I think maybe I'm attracted to people who do all kinds of different things through the course of their career. Was an early feminist and a socialist, worked with Charles Bradlaugh, was close to Shaw, and then met Madame Blavatsky, the founder of Theosophy. Who's a story in herself. Yeah. A story in herself. A, a Russian mystic who thought she was in communion with saints in the Himalaya. Talking of great biographies, Madame Blavatsky's baboon, fantastic. Absolutely, that would be great, yeah. yeah. And then comes to India to preach theosophy, uh, stays on, 
Uh, and then when the Irish Home Rule, Mo Home Rule Movement breaks out in 1914, is recalled to her Irish roots, becomes a radical, opposes British rule, is jailed, becomes the first woman to uh, uh, be appointed president of the Indian National Congress, and thinks she's, mother she's leading India to emancipation, but then Gandhi comes along and sidelines her, which he takes very badly. You know, that happens to politicians, <laughs> when somebody else comes and steals your thunder. And then dies, it is somewhat obscure and sad death, yeah. Oh. And um, who we got time for? I mean, Horniman, extraordinary Horniman, story. I think story. Somebody's story. Yeah. yeah, the most interesting. And also, in a sense, you know, as someone that just gets in trouble through his newspaper columns. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Horniman is among the, among the seven, my favorite. I mean, yeah. one is not supposed to have favorites among one's children. But I think among one's characters, one, one is allowed. Right. One, one Absolutely. is allowed. Right. Right. OK. So Horniman was a, a, an Englishman from a middle class family, a naval family born in Portsmouth, comes to India in the early 20th century to join the statesman of Calcutta, uh, where he identifies with the Swadeshi movement and marches with the protesters of the Swadeshi movement. In 1913, he moves to Bombay, where the uh, Indian nationalists have started an anti-establishment alternative to the Times of India called the Bombay Chronicle. And God knows the Times of India needs an anti-establishment <laughs> alternative today. Right? So Even East, then, it was a... Yeah, yeah, it was a <laughs> obsessively pro-establishment paper, you know? It's like... Blue Sasha. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so he comes there, edits the Bombay Chronicle, identifies identify with the workers of Bombay, with the peasant struggle led by Sadar Patel, which he supports and funds. In 1919, uh, you have the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, his paper carries the first reports, and then he's deported. The British put him on a ship, send him back to England, and for seven years he tries, heroically but unsuccessfully, to come back. He has petitions signed by Bernard Shaw, George Lansbury, and so on, and he wants to come back because he loves Bombay, he loves India, he's an Indian nationalist, and probably he has an Indian lover because he's gay. <laughs> and the passport is not granted, He's allowed to go to France on holiday, from where he takes a ship uh, to Ceylon and just lands up on the coast of Madras. Is this sort of Netaji in reverse? Huh? It's sort of Netaji in reverse. Ne Netaji in reverse, yeah. Uh, and sort of a little bit like an artist Asin story too, you know, today, <laughs> who isn't allowed to live in this country. And then returns to Bombay to a triumphant reception, uh, and then carries on as the newspaper editor for the next 20 years. There's a circle, circle, uh, I mean, how many of you know South Mumbai well? Oliver Circle. Okay. Now, some of the most distinguished people in Mumbai who have read this book, who include a former judge and a celebrated editor, thought Honeyman Circle, opposite the Asiatic Society, was named after a Parsi. <laughs> Nariman Circle, Honeyman Circle, because both good things in Bombay are named after Parsis. But it's named after this great campaigning journalist who founded the first trade union for working journalists and whose fight for the freedom of the press is compellingly relevant, as is being a gay, because it was much more difficult, you know, being a sexual dissenter in the 1920s. And he was the British intelligence people trying illegal. to blackmail him. Yeah. Yeah, it was illegal to try to blackmail him. So in some ways, I think he is my favorite character. And finally, finally not finally, but, but Stokes, also a fabulous story. Yeah. Yeah. So Stokes is an American, unlike the others William and I have talked about, born to a Quaker family in Philadelphia, uh, meets a doctor who works, is inspired, an uh, American doctor working with leprosy patients in Himachal Pradesh, comes out to Himachal, becomes a social worker, is disgusted with the church, falls in love with an Indian girl, joins Gandhi's movement, goes to prison, uh, comes out of prison, and then disagrees with Gandhi. And several of these people actually disagree with Gandhi, which is also a sign of their moral independence. You know, they're not just blind followers of Gandhi. So, Stokes disagrees with Gandhi's obsession with spinning. That to be a member of the Congress party, you have to spin so many yards a, a day. So he leaves the Congress, and then being an American, uh, becomes an entrepreneur, and plants the first apple seedlings in the Himalaya, laying the foundations of what is now a billion dollar industry. The Himachali apples, many of you have written, come from what Stokes did. So- There's little packs of- uh, Little packs, yeah. And, and he also becomes a Hindu, he changes his name. From Samuel, he becomes Satana. You know, he so identifies completely uh, with India. So he again, I mean, each of these characters is some of them actually really, I think, deserve full-fledged biographies. I think Horniman, for sure. Sto there is a Stokes book. There is a Stokes book, yeah. yeah. But Horniman and the story of the Bombay Chronicle 
I it's think amazing. for a young for a young young, yeah. young for a young writer would be a great subject. And it was quite exciting. I mean, there's real, there's real sort of action, the yeah, escaping yeah. and getting yeah. on. Um, we're nearly running out of time. Um, one final question before I hand over to the audience: How did these characters fare after independence? Yeah. They, they... So that's a good question. Two of them died before independence. One uh, died shortly after his honeymoon. Mira and Sarla worked in the Himalaya. Spratt, whom we've not talked about, who is from your university, Cambridge, a communist who is uh, arrested in the merit conspiracy case, also becomes a journalist in Bangalore, and interestingly moves from communism to the Swatantra Party and becomes the ideologue of the right-wing, free market, not right-wing, free market, Swatantra Party, marries an Indian girl. His children still live in Bangalore, and one of them gave me the love letters between father and mother. The mother was, was Tamil. So he stays on. He's a critic of Nehru. Uh, an American called Kaitan. On, because he'd left the Kantian path? Or, or what? Yeah, no, he, yeah. partly because he was too pro-Soviet. Right. And, uh, you know, Spratt was pro-market. Pro and the last person whom we not talked about briefly, Ketan, who's another American who founds the Gandhian University in Madurai and is a pioneer of ready rural development work and dies in the late 1980s. So several of them stay on and are rebels in independent India too against what they see as, I, I would call them rebels. In independent India, they serve as a moral conscience of the ideals of the freedom struggle and to what extent uh, they are going astray. Final question, what next? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I have oh, some of yeah. yeah. I would like to, at some stage, write a, a shorter, more argumentative book about Gandhi. Not 2,000 pages long, <laughs> unlike the last two volumes, but maybe a short uh, book about why we need Gandhi today. Yeah, very good. Very, very good. Thank you. Please, everyone, <laughs> huge round of applause. <laughs> How long do we have for questions? Shrupa, where are you? Brilliant. So hands up. Don't be shy. Uh, Ram, if I may ask with respect, why do you come across as so tolerant of the white British? Is it partly because you were based in South India, whereas the worst atrocities were committed in the north, the whippings, the floggings, the torture, the open killings of no, Indians no, I, by the see, British? No, no. I, there are good things and bad things about the British. There are good things and bad things of the Indians. My book starts with two epigraphs from Gandhi and Tagore. Right. And I don't believe in black and white portraits. I'm a historian, not an ideologue, or a pamphleteer, or a polemicist. I'm not seeking you know, political preferment or advancement. I'm a scholar, and I look at nuance. And they're very, for example, um, uh, if you look at our great, the great leaders of the Indian freedom movement, and I mean visionaries who transformed India, people like Gandhi and Tagore and Nehru and Ambedkar, uh, they thought like me. They didn't. I mean, if you look at Gandhi's closest friend was Charles Freer Andrews, who was an Englishman. So the idea that cultures is the opposite of imperialism to think all white people are bad or all Indians are good. So it's about nuance and complexity and what is actually happening. So uh, in my early work, uh, which Willie uh, talked about, I talked about the colossal environmental mismanagement by the British, because they knew nothing about how to manage forests. They already destroyed their forests, uh, and uh, then they came in search of oak and teak for their ships and so on. So there were aspects of colonialism, which were destructive that I've talked about, but there were also liberating aspects. And that was to make us wake up. The British gave us a kick in the backside about the way we treated our Dalits and our women. And it, so the idea that in Shivaji's India, or the Mughal India, it was all. So that's where I am. As I said, I'm a historian, not an ideologue. So I look, do not look at, some things are black. Hitler was black. Stalin was black. British rule in India had many dimensions, some of which were liberating, some of which were horrific and exploitative. And I'm not trying to, I'm not in a popularity contest. I try to tell the truth as I see it. And, and for a historian, nuance is all. Getting, huh? getting nuance is all. Getting exactly and, and these distinctions. Not just for a historian, for yeah. Tagore and Gandhi and for Ambedkar. Yeah. You know, so, so, but the people who made modern India. I mean, the narrowing of the Indian mind. One person I've not mentioned, Jyoti Bafule, wrote a tract on caste in the 1870s. It was dedicated to Abraham Lincoln. 
Today you will be told, how dare you dedicate a book to a white man? So I think India is closing into itself. Britain is also closing into itself. Russia is also closing into itself. Turkey is also closing into itself. And my book is an argument against xenophobia everywhere. The back here. Sorry, I have to make you run up the stairs. <laughs> um, yeah, I owe uh, Peter, my name is Peter Popham. I owe you a debt of gratitude, Ram. I read your. Wake up there, I can hear you properly. I mean, um, can you hear it now? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I owe you a, a debt of gratitude. I was based in India as the independence correspondent in Delhi yes. when I read your wonderful book, Savaging the Civilized, um, which has inspired the novel I wrote called India Be Damned, which is coming out shortly, um, and which is about precisely about people who, from this country, who went to India and discovered that was actually the place they wanted to live yeah. and make their cause. I just wondered, you mentioned how India needs Gandhi today. Yeah. Ga I mean, Gandhi, as several of, you, several of your characters in your book found things, disagreements with Gandhi, yeah. what aspects of Gandhi does India require today? That's a great question, Peter, and thank you for the kind words about my Elwin book. It's in many ways the favorite of all the books I've written because of what Elwin did to me. So obviously there's some things about Gandhi India does not need today is obsession with celibacy, for example, <laughs> and imposing it on all his followers, right? His obsession with Khadi. I think there are three or, th three or, three or, three or four things about Gandhi, I could talk about 10 or 12, that are crucial to India recovering its soul. One is Gandhi's absolute commitment to Hindu-Muslim harmony. The greatest danger to the Indian Republic today is the majoritarianism of my religion which is in power and dominant and reshaping every aspect of our society, and Gandhi would have been appalled by it. Uh, the second thing that we need from Gandhi, uh, that Gandhi was actually a precocious environmentalist. Restraint and responsibility in how we relate to nature and use natural resources, that's actually maybe the subject of a, the next book I talked about, which I might write. I'm way ahead of his time. Ah. I'm way ahead of his we're, time. Absolutely, way ahead of his time. The third aspect of Gandhi that we need is civility. You know, when uh, the great uh, uh, US Congressman John Lewis died a few months ago, I was listening to tributes. And he came many times to India, and he said, someone asked him, what did you learn from Gandhi? He said, how to disagree without being disagreeable. <laughs> so in our public life on Twitter, and the last thing that we need from Gandhi, and particularly if there are any powerful men in this room, is how to nurture followers and set them free. I mean, the kind of people Gandhi inspired and the kind of things they did on their own. Patel, Nehru, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Kriplani, Zakir Hussain, ex, you know, you're an extraordinary nurturer of talent as compared to, shall we say, people in power today, where it's all about themselves. And that's not just true of politics. It is true of public life. I mean, of, of some of our most powerful CEOs. Not just, and not just the ruling party. But not, the the yeah. Banyan tree effect. Uh, absolutely. Or, or, or NGOs. I mean, Dr. Kurian of Amul. Extraordinary figure who could never, who thought there would be no Amul after him. So this, these are some of the things. But I'd still say, as an Indian, and as A, as an Indian, and B, as a biographer of Gandhi, it's that absolute commitment to Hindu-Muslim harmony that India needs most of all today. From. Very vigorously thrust up hand here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And afterwards for Amanat, Hamid Karzai in the front row here. <laughs> um, in a lecture yesterday by Shashi Taru, he... Okay, hello. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Thank you. In a very illuminating lecture yesterday by Shashi Taru, he spoke about the self-serving uh, structure which the British um, uh, created by, uh, by virtue of the legal system in India. Yeah. Um, I wondered how you view the legal system today. Um, Can you just speak a little louder, please? Yeah. I, I just wondered how you view the legal system in India today, given 
all the turmoil, etc. So, uh, do read uh, the writings of, among others, Pratap Hanu Mehta and Gautam Bhatia, who was, uh, and there's a good book, a new good book by Arvind Narayan, who is a legal scholar and a constitutionalist on uh, where the legal system is in India today. So I'm not an expert, but these are people I respect who have the authority. Arvind Narayan, Gautam Bhatia runs a blog. Uh, which is, uh, someone may know the name, it's called Econ, if Constitutional Philosophy kind of stuff. You know, where judgments are critically analyzed. And they will, uh, uh, they are, you know, with due respect to Shashi and myself, they are the real experts. So read them. No, having uh, known both of you for decades, I think the perfect moment has come for you to co-author a book. Yeah. <laughs> Give us and time on that one. The, <laughs> No, it will be a bestseller because they are uh, great. There's great synergy. I, I do think, think that, our, that there are aspects of our work which have, has, is, is very much in parallel, particularly uh, what we were talking about biography. The, the way that, that there's been a feeling in India, as with many, I mean, as with the historical establishment, the post war historical establishment, this Tolstoyan idea of history that, that, that deeper economic and social forces drive everything, and that to believe that great men, as, 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 the, as pejoratively put, can alter the course of history uh, is highly frowned upon. No, but, but both what... Ram and I have written books which, uh, which very much emphasize human agency. Absolutely. And, and, and also the importance of narrative. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to write, and I think most importantly, uh, uh, the, the ability to make your work accessible yeah, to absolutely. an intelligent reading public, because one of the things that I think, one of the reasons that we've had WhatsApp University take over the understanding of, uh, of Indian history is that so many historians of India, of all nationalities, yeah. have, have written incomprehensibly. I think, that, yeah. that's, I think that's changing the last point. I, you know, so now it's changing and not a moment too soon. So in ancient India, which you haven't talked about, the work of Nenjot Lahiri, Upinder Singh, you know, uh, so I, it's now slowly changing, but not, not fast enough. I think no. there was a young man at the back who wanted to ask a question. There. Yeah. yeah, you. Yes, yeah. It's coming. Hi, Ram. My name is Utkarsh. I wanted to ask you about uh, disciplinary chauvinism. I have yeah. heard you talk about that yeah, a few yeah. times. Yeah. Do you see the past few years disciplinary chauvinism in India or the US has been growing? And uh, how do you yourself resist the temptation of, you know, not going down something that you advise against? That's a very good question. The question is about disciplinary chauvinism. Uh, that is, uh, how different social science or science uh, disciplines in natural social science have walls against one another, physics versus biology versus chemistry, and uh, in the social sciences, history versus sociology versus economics versus literature. You know, uh, I have never studied history in my life. My degrees, my BA, MA is in economics, my PhD is in sociology. And uh, I'm not exceptional. Uh, the great historian of ancient India, D.D. Kosambi, studied mathematics. The greatest living Indian historian today, whom I wish would write for a wider audience, is my great compatriot and Delhi University colleague, uh, Sanjay Subramaniam, who and your, did... And your cousin. Uh, no, 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 no relation. No relation. No relation. No relation. <laughs> That's WhatsApp University. No relation. No relation. No relation. No relation. At all. At all. Uh, studied economics. So I think and some of the finest biologists in the world today studied engineering or physics. But when you move from one discipline to another, you have to pay your dues. As a historian, I have to work doggedly in the archives. You know, I have to find new primary sources that no one else has found. But having been a sociologist and an economist before that, may give me a different kind of perspective. So I think the boundaries between disciplines must be broken. As, you, as I have said before, that when India, when the clock struck midnight on 14, 15, uh, August 1947, history ended and political science began. So we have to move across. It doesn't mean that you don't learn the disciplinary protocols. So a sociologist who does, uh, wants to be a sociologist must do rich and in-depth fieldwork, but must take soundings from history, from culture, from literature. So in that sense, because I mean, and history is an integrative discipline. In many ways, it is to 
the humanities, what biology is to the natural sciences, an integrated discipline, taking chemistry, physics, you know, philosophy, mathematics, you know, statistics, and so on in one. So, but you know, universities are structured in such a way in which uh, they're parochial. You have to, there are very few interdisciplinary journals. There's some very good ones, comparative studies in society and history is one in America, which is a brilliant uh, interdisciplinary journal. History workshop here is, is pretty interdisciplinary. But it, you know, I think it's, 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 it's maybe because my, my degrees are in economics and sociology, perhaps I've not been bound, uh, not just the fact that I'm not in university. You know, I'm not looking at... Do you think it's freed you, huh? the fact that you... you that to some extent, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. But essentially, at the same time, uh, I must, must make sure that I've looked at all the relevant archives. You know, I'm not faffing in the dark. And I'm not getting a research assistant to do my work. I'm actually going to the archives, right, and taking notes, synthesizing them, analyzing them, and then bringing a more sociological uh, perspective or an ecological perspective to what I'm doing. But many of the younger scholars today, I think, the, uh, will move beyond the academy, will not only be writing for their peers, will be innovative in their method, will pay attention to style and language, because history is both a branch of social science as well as a branch of literature. It's not just anecdotes, you know, but it's, it's rigor analysis, but communicated, as William said, in an accessible and hopefully even enthralling way. So I am very hopeful because of the younger historians I deal with. You know, I, I just, there's nothing in, the, in, in history that can't be communicated clearly. Ex exactly. And, but and, and to, I, uh, to, to create obscurity in your language. If I may just so make one last speech for the kind of people, young people I know, you know, and the kind of work they're doing, and I won't name them. In the last two months, I have read four or five manuscripts by young historians much younger than myself. One is an American who's written in a brilliant biography of Kamala Devi Jatopadhyay, the greatest Indian woman of the 20th century. One is a Muslim woman from Hyderabad who's written a fantastic history of women's writing in Urdu in Hyderabad. And the third is a male who's written an outstanding history of Assam since the Second World War. Fantastic books opening up, uh, not only telling stories compellingly, but opening up all kinds of areas of research. Urdu was regarded as a North Indian language. This book will change our understanding of that. Assam and its links to the Northeast and China and Burma, everyone writes about Bengal. There are too many Bengali historians and not enough Assamese historians. <laughs> right, so now you'll get this. And Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay has been ignored because the Congress did like her. Indira Gandhi actually did like her because maybe she felt rivalrous towards her and knew in what ways Kamala Devi was superior to her. So there's so much good work coming out, my friend, by younger historians. And it's a privilege to be part of this, you know, and to read their work, learn from it, engage with it, them. So I think a lot of the mourning and mourning I used to do 20 years ago is now out of date. I celebrate what's coming now. Do you think it's... Do you think, in a sense, it's too late that, that a whole generation have grown up not reading history? I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it, it is, well, not late, it's inadequate because of WhatsApp history and the way uh, the political class manipulates history for their own purposes, you know? And there are examples of that every day. So it's inadequate. Historians must not write accessibly. They must write in newspapers. They must write blogs. They must get their work translated into Indian languages, you know? So all that needs to be done. But of the sheer quality of the work emerging, this is the best time to be a historian or a reader of India, history in India. And non-fiction in general in India. I can only speak for history. <laughs> <laughs> time for one last question. The gentleman at the back with his hand up there, and then I'm afraid we must let you loose to buy Ram's books in large numbers. Uh, hi, hi, Ram. So I, I would be upfront and say that history is not my forte, but I'm a, a f great fan of yours for a subset of your work, which is cricket writing. Okay, okay. Right, so in fact, after CLR James, you are my favorite cricket writer. Thank you. Uh, and so I just wanted to know, is, is there anything coming up on cricket which is more futuristic? Which is? Which is more futuristic from your point of view? Like uh -huh. especially so, with uh, T20 <laughs> taking over test cricket. So, well, I published a book before this during the pandemic called The Commonwealth of Cricket. Yes, I read that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that was my farewell to cricket. Cricket writing. Farewell to cricket writing. I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I still go to Lord's Test Match. And again, there's so many good young writers. I mean, just read the kind of work that uh, Rahul Bhattacharya and Sharda Ugra and so on are doing. Uh, I still love the game. I was at Lord's last week, and I saw the New Zealand fight back and the England fight back. Uh, 
I still follow my club. Whenever I have to wear a tie uh, in an Oxford college, it's the tie of the French Union Cricket Club, Bangalore, <laughs> which is confused for the tie of a Cambridge college in Oxford and for the tie of a Oxford college in Cambridge. <laughs> so I have attachment to cricket, love for cricket, but both ho gaya. I'm written out on cricket. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, a big, large round of applause. <laughs> round box will be available in the time. Okay. I currently study at the University of York, and uh, over the last two years or so, I've been writing a lot of poetry and putting together a collection of poems. Uh, I've currently put together about 137 poems, hoping to publish it. That is a work in progress, and as soon as that never-ending process has come to an end, we'll see where I am. But here, as it stands here, uh, I have two poems to share with you today. And this first one, pretty simple, is about just a simple little conquer. And it's called In Conquering the Conquer. This cowardly conquer cushions my pocket. I pocket the conquer to conquer what's of it. Like branches, like leaves, leave light from trees. This conquer can be like candle in breeze. As breeze tries drop new seeds to ground, it unlocks greens for fairies found that seeds can scatter like soulful sand, demand new life from ever fond land. And then land grows from seeds been sown, from seed to stem to branch till grown. And then it comes callous to crowd shrubbery, not considering a conquer's company. And then we have conquer to conquer the land, form wood, form forest, from barkish band, all for this conquer's most candid insistence to conquer the land beyond all resistance. Clear spoken conquer kept there in my pocket. I kept it there till I figured what's of it. And I knew that I'd drop it once path end found but I didn't find end, only more ground. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share one more with you, and it's a quick one, so sorry for soaking up too much limelight. Um, this one is pretty simple. I was looking at two pairs, uh, two, two toothbrushes, teeth brush, whatever you want to pluralize it, uh, and they were looking at each other. And it made me think about how we own these items and how they interact with each other without speaking. So this is called Toothbrush Espionage. <laughs> I like the title too. Look at our teeth brush, tilt their bristles. Towards each other they whisper and whistle. Secrets and scenes of flatmates' means, of faces and traces down PJ seams. Then. In the morning, I pick my boy up to study my teeth and get rid of the muck. But they utter that Sarah won't dare ever flush. I'll snap at them, oi, you best keep that hush. I seek for my boy's silly bristle effect, but none of his tales have captured me yet. So he tells them to yours every trip to the dentures. Sharing like spies that meet at park benches. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's one more big round of applause for Will for some brilliant work.
whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer.